Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We are beginning a new series of lessons from the Seventh-day Adventist Church entitled The Gospel of Mark. So, you might guess that the first lesson is entitled The Beginning of the Gospel. It's our lesson one for July 6th of 2024. And we'd like to begin as usual with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we look back to the writings that were prepared for us so many years ago, brief, vigorous, moving, uh, the Gospel of Mark is a great thing to study. Be with us now as we study it together is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. So let's start off, who wrote the Gospel of Mark? Now that ought to be obvious, right? <laughs> <laughs> and why was it written? One of the early church fathers, Papias, or Papias, written between AD 95 and 110, suggests that Mark wrote out Peter's gospel. Do we have any evidence from the New Testament that this might be true? Well, 1 Peter 5, which we don't have here, uh, says that Mark was with Peter and the, near the very end of his life. And 2 Peter 1, verses 12 through 15 says, So I will always remind you, this is Peter we're, we're saying now, So I will always remind you of these things. I will make every effort to see that after my departure, what's he talking about? After his death. Yeah. After his death, um, you will always be able to remember these things. This is quoting from the NIV. How do you think Peter did this? Mark was with Peter near the end of his life, and that's 1, 1 Peter 5. From the Bible study guide, we have these notes. Jim? No gospel lists the name of the author. One of this, excuse me, one that comes closest to us to John with reference to the beloved disciple that is in John 21, verses 20 and 24. From the Bible study guide, however, from early times, such, excuse me, each of the canonical gospels has been associated with either an apostle, that is Matthew or John, or with a companion of an apostle. For example, the Gospel of Luke is linked with Paul, Colossians 4, 14, 2 Timothy 4, 11, Philemon 1, 24. The Gospel of Mark is linked with Peter. And there's that passage 1 from Peter, 1 Peter 5. 5, 13, uh, 13. Though the author of Mark never goes, gives his name in the text, Early church tradition indicates that the author of the Gospel of Mark was John Mark, and sometime, a sometime traveling companion of Paul and Barnabas, Acts 13, verses 2 and 5. We'll see that again in a little bit. Later, an associate of Peter, 1 Peter 5, 13, from, our Bible from the study Bible study guide. guide. Okay, and then here's the passage which I mentioned and which has not been mentioned twice, your sister church in Babylon, and I see in brackets Rome, also chosen by God, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. And we're, the reason for reading that verse is the fact that Peter says, calls Mark his son. But the footnote says, Babylon, as in the book of Revelation, this probably refers to Rome. Where was Rome, I mean, I'm sorry, where was Peter crucified upside down? Rome. In Rome. Okay, the next passage, the rest of the story. Go ahead, Jennifer. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through, 12 through 15. And so I will always remind you of these matters, even though you already know them and are firmly grounded in the truth you have received. I think it only right for me to stir up your memory of these matters as long as I am still alive. I know that I shall soon put off this mortal body as our Lord Jesus Christ plainly told me, I will do my best then to provide a way for you to remember these matters at all times after my death. So how could he do that? By and talking to Mark. <laughs> by talking to Mark and getting Mark to write it down. Mm -hmm. But now here's something that is not on our Bible study guide, but I think it should be. Uh, from Mark chapter 14, verses 50 to 52. This is at the Garden of Gethsemane. Then all the disciples left him and ran away. A certain young man, dressed only in a linen cloth, was following Jesus. They tried to arrest him, but he ran away naked, leaving the cloth behind. 
Okay, so who, why do you think that story is only told in the Gospel of Mark? Because Mark because was the was one Mark. who it happened to. <laughs> okay, do we have any other evidence that that could be true? There are more details about Mark in the book of Acts, which Luke wrote. Uh, look at Acts 12, 11, and 12. Duane? Then, after his miraculous release from prison, Peter realized what had happened to him and said, Now I know that it is really true. The Lord sent his angel to rescue me from Herod's power and from everything the Jewish people expected to happen. Aware of his situation... Now, let's just remember here. Now, where was Peter when all of a sudden he realized where he was? He's out on the street. Out on the street in, in the middle of the night. Nobody else is around. Okay. Aware of his situation, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Okay, so the big question here, was this the upper room described in several places in the Gospels? Very likely. So now if we stop, we go back, where did Jesus and the disciples leave from on their way to Gethsemane? The upper, the upper room. room. The upper room. And there was a, if there was a young man who probably at that point in time was a teenager, and he realized something really important was happening, he probably would follow them, right? And that's how he got into the story. Okay. It seems very likely that John Mark was a son of a woman named Mary, who, who apparently was a wealthy woman living in Jerusalem. It was at her home that the disciples found a welcome place to stay and eat known in the Bible as the upper room. Mark, sometimes called John Mark, worked with Saul or Paul and Barnabas when Mark was relatively young. So now we move down a few years and what happened? Acts 13, 1 to 5 and verse 13. The church in Antioch there were some prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Barnabas, si Simeon, Simon. Simeon, called the black. Simeon called the black, and Lu Lucius, Lucius. Lucius from Cyrene, and Manian. Manian, oh, these are hard for me, who had been brought up with Herod, the governor, and Saul. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to do the work which I have called them. They okay, fasted. hold on, I'm going to interrupt for a second. How did the Holy Spirit tell them that? Probably spoke through someone else. He inspired them to come to that conclusion. Well, the, and we're talking about, what did it say at the beginning of the passage there? In the church of Anak, there were some prophets. prophets. Probably through one of them, right? Okay, go ahead. Okay, they fasted and prayed, placed their hands on them, and sent them off. What happened? In Cyprus, verse 4, having been sent by the Holy Spirit, Barnabas and Saul went to Seleucia and sailed from there to the island of Cyprus. When they arrived at... Uh, Salamis. They, how do you say it? Salamis. Salamis. They preached the word of God in the synagogues. They had John Mark with them to help with the work. Paul and his companions sailed from Paphos, Paphos and came to Perga, the city in, in Pamphylia. He got some real, uh, yeah. real go goodies in here, didn't yeah. you? Where John Mark left them and went back to Jerusalem. Okay, Gordon. Now from the writings of Ellen White and Acts of the Apostles, it was here, that is at Pamphylia, that Mark overwhelmed with fear and discouragement, wavered for a time in his purpose to give himself wholeheartedly to the Lord's work. Unused, I think that's supposed to be unused. Un, well, okay. Unused to. Unused to, okay. Unused to hardships, he was disheartened by the perils and privations of the way. He had labored with success under favorable circumstances, but now amidst the opposition and perils that so often beset the pioneer worker, he failed to endure hardness as a good soldier of the cross. He had yet to learn to face danger and persecution and adversity with a brave heart. As the apostles advanced 
and still greater difficulties were apprehended, Mark was intimidated and losing all courage, refused to go further and returned to Jerusalem. That is, returned to mom in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Acts of the Apostles, 169. In short, things simply got hard and so he wanted out. And let's think about, this is a young man who's lived basically in the lap of luxury. I mean, you know, things are easy. He lives in a place, there's people coming and going. I'm sure his, wife, his mother, <clears throat> we don't know anything about his father. His father was probably already dead, but she probably had a lot of servants and he had a, the easy life. We do not know how old John Mark was at that time, um, but he must have been at least in his late 20s because this is like 15 years after his experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. So try to figure that out. However, the story of John Mark was not over yet. Keep reading. <laughs> he was Barnabas' cousin or possibly his nephew. In Acts 15, the story goes on. Some time later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brothers and sisters in every town where we preach the word of the Lord and let us find out how they are getting, along, getting on. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them, but Paul did not think it was right to take him because he had not stayed with them to the end of the mission, but had turned back and left them in Pamphylia. There was a sharp argument and they separated. Barnabas took Mark and sailed off for Cyprus. And then the question I would like to pose to all of you, was this God's way of doubling the number of evangelistic teams? <laughs> mm. Maybe. It had that result. Yeah. Maybe this is an example of God works for good, things that are bad. The yeah. argument between, the, between them ends up doubling the forces. Yeah. Paul depended a great deal on his fellow missionaries to keep up with the heavy schedule that he maintained. I mean, imagine, <laughs> we don't have time to read this 2 Corinthians 11 passage, but you, if you've ever read that, I mean, he had went through shipwrecks and he went through beatings and tortures and do, he walked thousands and thousands of miles on the rough, those rough Roman roads and, okay, come on, keep up, come on, no, don't slack, don't <laughs> fall behind, you know? Wow. Paul's schedule in included a lot of very difficult situations. He was disappointed in Mark's behavior on their first trip. He did not want to go through that again. The important thing for us to realize is that Mark's ministry was not over. Jim? Colossians 4.10, Aristarchus, who is in prison with me, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have already received instructions to welcome Mark if he comes your way. Then okay, you want to do the next one? Second Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he can help me in the work. Good News Bible. So does it sound like Paul and uh, Mark have uh, reconciled? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Philemon one twenty four. And so to my fellow workers, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, Good News Bibles. See, First Peter yeah. 5. 5, 13, we already read. An amazing transformation come, excuse me, seems to have occurred in Mark. In these passages, Paul indicates the value of Mark to him and to the ministry. Paul counts him as one of the fellow workers and wants Timothy to bring Mark with him. The book of First Peter indicates that Peter as well as, as, Peter well, as well, had a close relationship with Mark. These books by Paul and Peter were written likely in the early AD 60s, some 15 to 20 years after the experience in Acts 15. Mark clearly recovered from his failure, almost certainly through the trust that his cousin Barnabas placed in him from the Bible study guide. Okay, while well, John began his gospel with the pre-existence of Christ, Matthew and Luke talked about the childhood of Jesus, Mark jumped straight into the beginning of his ministry. He began with the story of Jesus' baptism by John. We see, that not, we see that not only Jesus was present, but also the Father spoke and the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove. This trinity appearance at his baptism was duplicated at the cross near the end of his earthly ministry. Mark tied Jesus' baptism to several passages in the Old Testament, 
See Exodus 23, 20, Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Malachi 3, 1. Notice that these three passages all talk about movement, about journeying, without being on the way, with, uh, about being on the way. So Mark introduced his gospel, which is a gospel full of movement and action. And it's pretty good, pretty good evidence that Mark was addressing particularly the, the Roman Latin audience. And a lot of them were soldiers and they were, they were into action and doing things and moving and so forth. So he's okay, let's, let's talk about Jesus and we'll talk about him as if he was almost a Roman soldier. Who can be sure that Satan was there at Jesus' baptism? That was the event that marked the end of the 69 weeks prophesied in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And the beginning of that eventful 70th week, which included the ministry and crucifixion of Jesus and ended with the termination of the special focus of God on the Jewish people with the stoning of Stephen, Stephen and the spread of the Christians uh, to many parts of the Mediterranean, of course, carrying the gospel with them. The next event in the life of Jesus after his baptism was his time in the wilderness. What do we know about that? In Matthew 4, chapter 1, then was Jesus led up of the whole, no, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And that's reading the, the King James Version there. Yeah. Did the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted by the devil? No. I'll go out on a limb. <laughs> okay. So, you know, you could read that that way. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. But Gordon says no. Lead us into he temptation. was led into the wilderness to contemplate his mission and yes. solidify it. And he was tempted by the devil at the same time. And near the end of that experience. Our Bible study guy mentions that Christ came to this earthly this earth primarily to save us. But for those who understand the great controversy, there is a much larger picture. Jesus came to this world for reasons far beyond our salvation. And see the handout, the plan of salvation, the setting of the great controversy, of, from which we're going to quote, quote a few passages. The plan of salvation involves the whole universe. Duane, I think that's yours, right? Okay. Ephesians 1. For by the blood of Christ we are set free, that is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God, which he gave to us in such large measure. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as head. So how many are involved? All. All creation. Heaven and earth. Okay. Myra? Ephesians 3, 7 to 10. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people. Yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles, the good news about the infinite riches of Christ. Can I interrupt for there for a second? Who's talking here? Paul. Paul. And what is he saying? He is the least. I'm the last. I'm the least. And what, what, what is his great privilege? This Pharisee is taking the gospel to the Gentiles. I mean, how, how upside down backwards is this from his upbringing, right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, verse verse nine. 9. And of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that the present, at the present time, by means of the church... Well, who's involved here? All of us, the church. Okay, what's going to happen? Well, we'll see. It's a secret. By means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. Okay, what possibly could the angels standing around the throne of God 
learn about God from us. How God deals with... Rebellion. Yeah. Basically, how God deals with sin and rebellion. Okay, Colossians 1, Gordon? 19 and 20 verses. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. Okay, in so how is it that what does the cross do for sinless angels? That's the question. Okay, and we read now from Mellon White, through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought out even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. What could be more important than, the, than us? Yeah, right. Through the revelation of the character of God in Christ, the beneficence of the divine government would be manifested before the universe. How many does that include? The whole, all of it, every bit there is. The charges of Satan, the charge of Satan refuted. The nature and results of sin made plain. And the perpetuity of the law fully demonstrated. Those are big, big, huge challenges, right? And there's, Ellen White talks about those in several locations. And if, if you happen to get her handout in the electronic form, and you want to look at the context of these verses, you can hold down the key, uh, hold on, you can hold down the control key in your computer, and you click on this little that's only if they have it in Word. If, if they're on an iPad or on a PDF well, electronically, just click on it. Yeah, yeah, it worked fine with, on a PDF, yeah. Okay, Jim, Ellen White, go ahead. What the plan of redemption had a yet broader, deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded. But, as, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligence of the world, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before the, his crucifixion, he said, now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all unto myself, or unto me, John 12, 31. So, so who, did, was Jesus aware of what was going on here? Sure. Yes. Did he understand the full context? How many, who else understood at that point in time? Nobody. Virtually, if, if you go and you read the, where Ellen White talks about this, she says, she gets down to the, the final event, she says, who is watching? Heaven and the heavenly angels, the Godhead, Satan and the angels, period. Not a single human being understood what was going on at this point in time. Fortunately, we, with the help of people like Ellen White, have managed to go back and put the story together. Okay? Now the judgment of this world, that, that's a judgment about Jesus' message as opposed to everything else they've been hearing for the millennia. Yeah. The act of Christ dying in the, for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. Is that important? That's an education process, isn't mm -hmm. it? Absolutely. Very, very important. Okay, Jennifer. From Ellen G. White, The Desire of Ages. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. Not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, as 1 Peter 1.12 states. 
and it will be their study throughout endless ages. So how many people are going to be studying the plan of salvation for the rest of eternity? The whole universe. We already read about how we will be doing that study and the angels will be doing that study. That sort of includes everybody, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, Duane, you want to take up one of those? <coughs> Alan White. Again, when you think about it, it's, it's eternity, but uh, the first thousand years that are people are there, uh, they're not perfect when they got there. They have a whole lot of education to do. Well, yeah, okay, go ahead. Dwayne? Uh, to the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Wow. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. Think that was an important thing to do? Mm. <laughs> Go ahead. And, and everything that God, Jesus, Yahweh had been doing was to bring harmony into his, his creation mm -hmm. for millennia. And it wasn't until the cross that they finally yeah. got it sorted out. The other side needs to be clearly revealed and, and the consequences clearly revealed. Yeah, otherwise it's, you're, you're just dealing with one, one aspect of something, yeah. but you see in the big bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why don't, why don't we get it? Duh, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, that's a good question, a very good question. So well, most of us, most of the human race has never even heard of that. I, they've never, it's never even been suggested to them. But of course, Adventists, what's, the, what's their excuse? Well, they, they want to be like the other religions. It's just like the children of Israel want to be other, like the other surrounding nations. So you've you got a real well, mess, a milieu. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Anyway, you're going to comment again? Well, one, one thing it seems to me is they had quite a lengthy period of time to observe, and, but, but even during that time, yep. th there, were, there were statements that Ellen White made where she said the angels were willing to step, say, Get you, rid of those people. You've done it. It's, it's over. Yeah. He said, no, it's not over yet. Yeah. Okay. The arch apostate. Yeah. The arch apostate had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. And just to clarify, who is the arch apostate? The adversary, Satan. Satan. Satan the, also sometimes called the devil, sometimes called the dragon, some kind called, uh, what else, a serpent? Well, you notice that he used, he used the word deception. Mm -hmm. and deception is not not necessarily bald-faced lies. No, no. That's mixing truth with error, mm -hmm. and that's when you end up with deception. Yep. And it, you, you give them enough to tickle their ears, mm -hmm. and then you, you, you hook them with their and falsehoods. If you want to see that all the way through the Bible, Go to that handout that's mentioned there. The security of the universe was even more important to God than the salvation of man. And this is a quotation that causes some theologians to turn over in their grave because they think it's all about us. Okay? From Ellen G. White. This is from manuscript. From Signs of the Times. Signs of the Times. Okay. It was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption, that Christ bore the penalty in behalf of the human race. The throne of justice must be eternally and forever made secure, even though the human race be wiped out. Another creation populate the earth. Wow. So By this, this tells us what? What's the most important thing? The questions in the great controversy have to be dealt with and have to be answered, yes. even if the human race gets wiped out. Okay? By the sacrifice of Christ, by the sacrifice Christ was about to make, all doubts would be forever settled. And the human race would be saved if they could return to their allegiance. Christ alone 
could restore honor to God's government. The cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by heavenly universe, by satanic agencies, by the fallen race, by every mouth would be stopped, and every mouth would be stopped. And you could be sure that these quotations were put there by me. Mm -hmm. The quotations from Ellen White, because this doesn't go with the, yeah. the usual theme of the lesson. Okay? And there's another one here. Um, who is able to describe the last scenes of Christ's life on earth, his trial in the judgment hall, his, the, his crucifixion? Who witnessed these scenes? And here's the thing I mentioned earlier. Go ahead. The heavenly universe. God the Father, Satan, and his angels. And how many human beings understood what was going on? They witnessed, but they didn't know what was going on. Not a clue. Much of it they didn't even witness. Mm -hmm. They fell yeah. asleep. Yeah. Those who were close fell asleep, yeah. the disciples. And in, in terms of the actual crucifixion, from most of that time when he was on the cross, it, nobody could see anything. It was completely dark. You couldn't, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. So, you know, last week we mentioned that Peter and Paul didn't have an idea beyond the, the second coming, second coming mm -hmm. that there was a third coming. They were in the dark. Yeah. Are we in the dark or are we have all of this information? Yep. And if we pay no attention to it, or if we haven't bothered to study it, yes, we're in the dark. Okay, returning to Mark 1, we see... Mark 1, 14 and 15. After John, that is John the Baptist, had been put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee and preached the good news from God. The right time has come, he said, and the kingdom of God is near. Turn away from your sins and believe the good news. And I'm going to just mention a little detail here about the ministry of John as compared to the ministry of Jesus. We know almost nothing about the first year of Christ's ministry. He realized that in the, in the area of Judea, if he, if he made anything very public, very many big splashes, he would be immediately shut down by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So he worked sort of under the radar for almost a year. Then when John, was, when John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus said, okay, it's time to move on. He moved from Judea to Galilee. He worked in Galilee for about a year. And when John was beheaded, he said, okay, it's time to move on again. He actually moved out and started working in the territories outside of Jewish territory. So the arrest of John, he moved from Judea to Galilee. With the death of John, he moved from Galilee to Tyre and Sidon to... Uh, Korea. Huh? Korea. Korea and also up in the north and, and sometime in, in some in Samaria as well. Um, he just, it, it got so difficult with him and the people, so many enemies following him that he, he had to get out, outside of Jewish territory. Well, notice particularly the three parts of, to John's message. One, prophecy was being fulfilled. Two, covenant promises were being fulfilled. And three, this called Jesus' followers to discipleship. Okay. Daniel 9, we don't have time to analyze that. Um, maybe we should take time to just read it. As seven, seven times 70 years is the length of time God has set for freeing your people and your holy city from, the sin, from sin and evil. Sin will be forgiven and eternal justice established. So that was accomplished by what? The ministry and life and death of Christ, right? so that the vision and the prophecy will come true and the Holy Temple will be rededicated. Not, note this and understand it. From the time that the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem, that was, what's the date for that? 457 BC. 457 before Christ. Until God's chosen leader comes, seven times seven years will pass. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong fort defenses and will stand for seven times 62 years, but this will be a time of troubles. And at the end of, uh, of that time, God's chosen leader will be killed unjustly. 
the city and the temple will be destroyed by the invading army of a powerful ruler. The end will come like a flood, bringing the war and destruction which God has prepared. That ruler will have a firm agreement with many people for seven years, and when half this time has passed, he'll put an end to sacrifices and offerings. And when did that happen? At the crucifixion of Christ, what happened? The curtain in the, the curtain was ripped was down from top, top to bottom. The awful horror will be placed on the highest point of the temple and will remain there until the one who put it there meets the end which God has prepared for him. And there's a lot of complicated language there. As I said, we won't take time to go through all those details, but that's the 70-year that's the prophecy. So the 70, seventh year in the reign of Artaxerxes, it happened 457 BC, the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes. It extended down to AD 27 and then ended with the final week from AD 27 to AD 34. It was during that final week of seven years that Jesus was baptized, carried out his ministry and was crucified and returned to heaven. At the end of that week, Stephen was stoned and the gospel spread to the Gentiles. Why did it spread to the Gentiles at that point in time? Paul was there. Paul was there, he observed it and what did he do? He and some of his buddies started an, in, an intense persecution of Christians. And what did they do? They scattered, taking the gospel with them. Okay, so it was a prophecy. It was fulfilled. God's covenant, was, covenant prophecy was fulfilled. And what, what was supposed to happen as a result? They were called to discipleship. Notice the parallel in Revelation 14, 6, and 7. And who is that? What time period are we talking about here? Three what? angels' message time. The three angels' message. And who does that involve? Us. Okay. Who's next reading? Mine, I think it is. Revelation 14, 6, and 7. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, le tribe, language, and nation. So just like John's message was a prophecy, here's another prophecy. He said in a loud voice, honor God and praise his greatness. There's the covenant. For the time has come for him to judge, worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. So here's a passage. Basically, it's saying the same, me same basic message that was given to John in preparing for Christ's first coming has, be has been given to, guess who? All of us to prepare people for the second coming. Okay? Mark 1 suggests that the time had come and the kingdom was near. This shows the fulfillment of the time prophecy and the covenant promise. Uh, Revelation 14, 6 and 7 repeat the same idea. The judgment hour has come. The everlasting gospel is to be proclaimed. People are to, be, to repent and believe, and they are to be called to be disciples, and they are to worship God. As we have noted in prior lessons, Revelation 13 talks about Satan's trinity and his success at winning almost the entire world. Revelation 14 is God's response and why he challenges us to come out of Babylon and worship the true God. Mark began his gospel by talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the time Mark was writing his gospel, probably in the 60s AD, many people were writing stories about the amazing life of Jesus. But those stories were not inspired and they are not to be believed. And I have a couple of pretty good sized volumes at home about these apocryphal stories. We usually don't talk about them, but there's, there's some wild stories, some really wild stories written by people. Um, about things that happened in those early years. Well, Mark skipped over all the interesting details of Christ Jesus' early life and went straight to the time of his baptism and then jumping over the whole year he spent in Judea, working there under the radar, right to the beginning of his Galilean ministry. It would be well to take a pause for a moment or two and ask ourselves, what is the gospel? Jim? With the exception of Mark, no other gospel writer uses the expression, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, in his writings. The expression is found only in Mark. It tells us that Jesus Christ and his gospel constitute the focus and the essence of Mark's narrative. 
Thus, we would do well in our study of Mark's gospel to begin by asking, what is the gospel? From the lexicographical studies, the Greek expression euangelion, commonly translated as gospel, as more that has more than a single meaning. Euangelion refers to God's good news to humans, good news as proclamation. It also pertains to a book dealing with the life and teaching of Jesus Christ, a gospel account. The expression euangelion also is connected to the connected with the details relating to the life and ministry of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. So, I mean, what do we have? We have Jesus, who himself is the Word, and all about him is the Word in, in the form of the Gospel written down and this forth. So it's, this is God's message to us. It also could be a message that can help make you good. Mm -hmm. Okay, with these definitions in mind, we may reason that Mark used, uses the expression gospel to describe the merciful acts of Jesus during his ministry, as well as to, de to designate the idea of the gospel itself as good news from God in our Bible study guide, page 14. Mark was written to a Roman audience. Many people have recognized that. They were excited about movement and action. And so Mark did not spend time focusing on long sermons or discussions. Instead, he talked about the miracles and the active ministry of Jesus. So already in chapter 1, what's he talking about, Jennifer? Mark chapter 1, verses 22 and 39. The people who heard him were amazed at the way he taught, for he wasn't like the teachers of the law. Instead, he taught with authority. So he traveled all over Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. Just casually going around driving out demons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to Mark, the gospel was good news acted out in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. He tried to put that information down as succinctly as possible in his gospel. Mark was hoping that we will see the active life of Jesus through his words. One of the biggest challenges for Christians right from the beginning has been to try to understand how Jesus could be fully human and fully divine at the same time. Mark tried to deal with that by several verses in his gospel. Okay, Dwayne, lead, lead us through the challenge here. Another key set of words at the beginning of the gospel according to Mark is Jesus Christ. How does Mark portray Jesus? Throughout his account, Mark depicts Jesus as the Son of God. Okay, now that expression in Aramaic, to say Son of God, means what? He's divine. It means you are, uh, to say Son of something means you are equivalent to that thing. So, son of, the expression Son of God means a divine person. Okay, go ahead. Uh, he uh, depicts him also as the Son of Man. Okay, so that means what? Son of Man means? You are a human being. Okay, go ahead. And also as the Son of David. You are descendant of David, okay. Of these three identities, Jesus' divine credentials are presented at the beginning of Mark's Gospel. Okay, so let's look at some passages where it talks about that. Myra? Mark 1.1. 1, 1. This is the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay, there. He is a divine being. Go ahead. Mark 9, 30 and th verse 30, 31. Jesus and his disciples left that place and went on to Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where he was because he was teaching his disciples. The Son of Man. Okay, will now be there's a human over. being. Yes. Will be handed over to those who will kill him. Three days later, however, he will rise to life. Okay, now let's let's put this picture together a little bit. I talked to I, I suggested to you that the first year of his three and a half years of ministry, he spent mostly focusing on Judea. When things got bad there and John was and John was 
uh, arrested, he moved mostly to Galilee. He traveled in and out too, but mostly his focus. And that's this, the part, the, the synoptic gospel, that's uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, mo mostly focus on what happened in Galilee. Okay. And we see here he's, he's identified as the son, of, the son of man. And at this point in time, um, why is Jesus saying, I don't want anyone to know where I am? He was teaching him. Starting at that point in time, he has six months where he's trying to intensively focus on teaching his disciples. Yeah. And then the final six months is going to be leading, step by step, leading his way to Calvary. Okay, so this is the, the reason he doesn't want people to know. It's not that he doesn't want anyone to know what he's really saying. I, I have a very specific yeah. challenge I'm working on right now, training my disciples. I don't want conflict with the Pharisees yeah. and Sadducees yeah. to take me out before, before the right time. And you'll notice that what did he tell his disciples as he was beginning this time of training? They're going to kill me, and oh, three days yeah. later, I'll rise to life. And, they and his disciples said, oh, sure, we understand that perfectly, right? No. <laughs> Did not understand. Did not understand a single word, okay? Then in Mark 10, verse 47, he says, When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, take pity on me. So he was a Jew. Not only that, he was of the Jew of the... Um, what do we say? The, the, the Davidic line. The, yeah. the, to mark the appearance of Christ as a human being on this earth was the most exciting event that had happened in our world's history. Mark wanted to tell us about each of the exciting events which took place, and there were plenty of them, right? Yeah. Mark presented Jesus, presents Jesus Christ as holy. What do we mean by holy? Set aside. Hmm? Set aside. Set aside. In other words, special, different, se set apart, separate. Okay. Not mundane or not. Yeah. Uh, not common. Not common. The, the word in Greek suggests that someone is set apart for a special purpose. That certainly applied to Jesus Christ. After brief introductory comments in Matthew 1 that we have noted, Mark also covers the baptism and temptations. The call of the four fishermen which this is now, we're already into the early years, early part, I'm sorry, of his Galilean ministry, the call of the four fishermen, the healing of the man with an evil spirit, and the healing of many others, in addition to preaching in Galilee, all that is in Mark 1 already. He's not wasting any time, is he? Mark recognized that Jesus was a teacher, a preacher, and a healer. Jesus did all those things many times, often in local synagogues. And why would he focus on local synagogues, do you think? Mm. That's where you get the, most, the biggest audience. No doubt the local people recognized how different the teachings of Jesus were compared to the usual speeches of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Try to imagine what it would have been like to live in the Palestine area in the days of Jesus. Very quickly, the word got around that this itinerant preacher had the power to heal almost any kind of disease, even raising the dead. There were no hospitals or scientifically trained physicians, and so the sick and the demon-possessed flocked to him. They came from hundreds of miles away, from Damascus in the north all the way to Idumea in the south. So just about from, well, from Syria to Egypt. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you've got a problem, where do you go? There's a guy down there that knows how to solve these problems. Mm. Okay. Galatians 1, 6. I yeah. am surprised at you. In no time at all, you are deserting the one who, who called you by the grace of Christ and are accepting another gospel. Okay. So unfortunately, now we have to introduce the fact that there are other versions of what people think are the good news, right? Mark is going to say, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ and tell you the truth about Jesus Christ. And I'm going to try to, I'm, going to, I'm not going to deal with any of these other gospels. Since Mark made such an emphasis on the gospel, we need to be very clear about what the gospel is. What does the gospel mean to us in 2024? 
Why is that information important to me? What do I choose? Why do I choose to believe it? Okay, so there's a challenging set of questions. Why do we choose to believe what we believe? Don't everybody talk at one time. Because it seems to make sense based on the Bible, all of the Bible that we understand and Ellen White. And many of us, it's because we got it from our parents yeah. who believed it. That's also another part of the story. It, it's, it's generally accepted by our peer group, right? Mm -hmm. So think about, this is a challenge to all of you listening out there. Think about what, what groups and what influences have impacted your life the most. That's really the question. Some people believe what they believe because of what their pastor said, and mm -hmm. their pastor may be misled. We live in a time of almost total dominance, especially of the younger generations, by social media. How can we as Christians carry the gospel to this generation of social, social media addicts? Excuse me for being very blunt here, but... Can we, can we convince them that God's word, even though written so long ago, is still relevant? Shall we talk about some serious questions here? Mm -hmm. How do you convince them that, I think of my grandchildren, how do, I, how do I convince them that something that happened thousands of years ago is really important for them? Okay, let's take an example. Can you think of an example from the life of Jesus that has a large impact on your personal life? Could you explain that to a friend? Okay, there's an example. What well, was something in the life of Christ that's been particularly significant to you? And then, could you explain that to a friend? Okay, now we're going to go to a little more detail in, of the background here. We believe that Mark is the earliest gospel. And let's see, where are we here? Well, these are a bunch of comments by William Barclay yeah. in, in his series. He, and he, a lot of other people would say this as well, so, but he, he does it very well here. The earliest gospel. When we begin to examine the matter more closely, well, this is Mark is supposedly written as the first of the Gospels. When we begin to examine the matter more closely, we begin to see that there is every reason for believing that Mark must have been the first of the synoptic Gospels to be written, and that the other two, Matthew and Luke, are using Mark as a basis. Mark can be divided into 105 sections. Of these sections, 93 occur in Matthew and 81 in Luke. Of Mark's 105 sections, there are only four which do not occur either in Luke or in Matthew. So what we're saying here is 95% or something of Mark is copied in either Matthew or, Mar or Luke. Uh-oh, it was plagiarized, huh? Well, uh, hold on. Mark has 661 verses, Matthew has 1,068 verses, Luke has 1,149, so each of those have more. Mark reproduces no fewer than 606. Matthew, Matthew. Pardon me, Matthew has 606 <coughs> of uh, Mark's verses, Luke reproduces 320. Of the 55 verses Mark, of Mark, which Matthew does not reproduce, Luke produces, reproduces 31. So there are only 24 verses in the whole of Mark which are not reproduced somewhere in Matthew or Luke. It is, wow, so what does that mean? It is not only the substance of the verses which is reproduced, the very words are reproduced. Not every case, but mostly, yeah. And is that in, in the Greek or in English or both? That, well, especially in the Greek, but yeah. fairly often translated the same as well. Matthew uses 51% of Mark's words and Luke uses 53%. Still further, both Matthew and Luke, as a general rule, follow Mark's order of events. Occasionally, either Matthew or Luke differs from Mark as to the order of events but they never in any case both differ against him. Always at least one of them follows Mark's order of events. So, 
improvements on Mark. Since Matthew and Luke are both much longer than Mark, it might justly po just possibly be suggested that Mark is a summary of Matthew and Luke, but there is one other set of facts which show that Mark is earlier. It is the custom of Matthew and Luke to improve and to polish Mark, if we, we may put it so. Let us take some instances of that. Sometimes Mark seems to limit the power of Jesus. At least an ill-disposed critic might try to prove that he was doing so. Let us take three passages which are all accounts of the same incident. Mark 1, 34, And he healed many that were sick with diverse diseases and cast out many devils. Matthew said, And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all that were sick. He's not leaving anything to chance. Luke 4, 40, And he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. Let us take other, take other three similar examples. Mark 3, uh, 8, for he had healed many. Matthew says he healed them all. Luke says he healed them all. Matthew and Luke both change Mark's many into all so that there may be no suggestion of any limitation in the power of Jesus Christ. There's a very similar change in the account of the events of Jesus' visit to Nazareth. <clears throat> Let us compare the account of Matthew and of, Math, uh, uh, of Mark and of Matthew. Mark 6, and he could there do no mighty work, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Matthew says, and he did not do, he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Not that he could not, but he did not. Matthew shrinks from saying that Jesus could not any mighty work, could not do any uh, mighty works and changes the form of the expression so that there may be no possibility of any limitation on the power of Christ. Of Jesus. Sometimes Matthew and Luke leave out little touches in Matthew in case they could be taken to belittle Jesus. Matthew and Luke omit three statements in Mark. When he looked around, Mark says, with anger, being grieved. Mark says, and when his friends heard it, they went out to lay hold on him, and they said, he is beside himself. Mark says he was moved with indignation. And remember, Matthew was a one who was always very impulsive. And now this is Matthew's gospel, okay? that he gave to, to Mark. And so Mark is carrying out this idea. But these verses, these words suggest that Jesus is, is losing his, maybe his, he's impulsive, he's not controlled. And we don't have to read time to read on, but encourage you to get this handout and you see that the rest of the materials, there are other suggestions. But we're going to see how all this fits together to tell us very clearly the story of Jesus. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these four Gospels. And we might wonder why Matthew and, and, and Luke copied so much of Mark when, in fact, John tells that there, were <clears throat> there could be hundreds of books written. But we'll perhaps understand that better when we get to heaven. Thank you for this, these insights that we have. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.